Well, good afternoon. I want to welcome you all right here to Kingdom Life Fellowship. Thank God for all of our members on tonight, as well as those who tuned in with us, all our visitors. We want to praise the good Lord for all of you. Thank God for um, these series of sermons tonight. We're going to talk about the last um, church in the book of Revelation where Jesus was addressing the seven churches, the Laodicean church. Tonight we'll be discussing um, this church. And I pray these series of sermons have been a blessing to you. It has made me really um, concentrate more in my prayer life as a pastor to make sure we here at Kingdom Life are not falling um, victim to some of the things that these seven churches fell victim to. I don't care how great of a service, and I don't say this to belittle any church or what our service was um, a couple of days ago, but I just know we've got to be real careful and cautious of how much pride we put into a lot of things because believe it or not, it'll easily puff us up to believe that all is well. And based on these churches here, we know that all was not well because if all was well, Christ would have never addressed them through John. He would have never um, called them out. And although he criticized them over here um, or more so gave them praise over here by saying what you're doing over here is OK. But here are some areas. Here are some some loopholes that you need to fix. And so therefore, I'm grateful tonight that Christ don't shun me and cast me out, that he gives me room. And I'm pausing because I want you to get that tonight. If Christ gave these churches room, um, which means grace, shouldn't we be giving each other's grace when we fall, stumble? Nobody tonight has it all together. Um, we're all a work in progress. Give a brother some grace. If you see that I fall more than three times, hey, still give me grace. Don't put a number. Don't try to keep track of how many times I keep falling. Just give me grace. God don't keep track of the time you have fallen and have done what you've done unto him. So I'm excited tonight what the Lord is going to say. We had a wonderful service this past Sunday morning. Our youth just rocked the house. God did a great thing and the benefits of the covenant. So God is doing a pretty cool thing right here at Kingdom Life Fellowship. Remember, um, our services, not only is it on Facebook, um, but it's also on YouTube. So, hey, if anything were to happen um, and we cannot uh, connect with you through Facebook, we are on YouTube. So right there on the screen, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll be able to just transition right on over. Because, again, God has given the church so many opportunities and platforms that we can now use. And we want to make sure we're using every platform that we possibly can to be able to reach you tonight with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be again in much prayer for all of our pastors right here in Clinton, Sansom County, all of our local churches. Uh, it's just a praying time for our community and the world. Don't forget but to be praying for the world, praying for all over this world because there's so much happening right now. Again, I said this last week, it may not be affecting your house, but it's biblical. And if it's biblical, we need to be praying over it because, again, the coming of the Lord is here. It's knocking on the door and it's time for the saints to start praying um, that all would look to Jesus, all would look to God, uh, who truly has all the answers that many hearts right now are asking for. So thank God tonight for you. Would you pray with me on tonight? Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We pray tonight, God, your presence would be rich within the house. We pray you would give us all that we would need, oh God, from your word tonight. And we become doers of your word. And God, we want to say we pray for our um, local um, churches. We pray for, Lord, our all the churches, oh God, that are represented tonight. We pray, Lord, for our state. We pray for our world. We pray for this country. God, I pray that every man, woman, boy, and girl look to you, Jesus. I pray, God, that through life would just humble them and they would realize I need God or more so what must I do to be saved. So, Father, we give you praise tonight what you're going to do through all the pastors. I pray they stand bold and flat-footed and tell someone that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray tonight your will be done, word be spoken, and you make a way for your people. We pray and ask these things all in Jesus' name. And all of the people of God tonight, bless the name of the Lord. The last uh, seven, the last church, the Laodicean church, I'm over in the book of Revelations chapter 3. I'm again at verse 14. Now, I want you to realize and truly understand, don't, don't, I don't know why we're so afraid to read the book of Revelation. So many people will say, hey, it's just a difficult book. It's a scary book. I don't want to find out. I don't want to know what's going on. Hey, this is a moment you need to dig into the book of Revelation. You need to be aware. Remember what the Bible also tells that God says, my people are um, perish for the lack of knowledge. We need knowledge more than anything else in our said churches. 
We need revelation. We need wisdom. We need knowledge of the word of God. I don't want to perish because I don't know. I want to know what's going to happen uh, once the rapture has taken place. I want to know what's happening before the rapture takes place. I want to be able to see so it will give me a sense of urgency. And that's the word tonight that I want you to carry from tonight's message, an urgency to pray, an urgency to get things right in my heart, an urgency to cover my pastor and the leaders of my church, an urgency to make sure I'm not that vessel um, that the devil is using in my church, that I'm clean, sanctified from the inside out, not the outside in, but from the inside out. I just want to make sure that all is well with my soul and my church. There is a sense of urgency that it should be in the body of Christ, as well as within our churches, to be praying um, for our churches. So the church of Laodicea, chapter 3, verse 14 and mind you, I, I, I talk about that common thread that's within all seven churches. There are certain things that he keeps repeating. And when he has to repeat himself, that tells you that, that you really need to anchor down upon these repeated statements that Christ is telling these churches to do. So let's look at it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. I want to just stop there for a split second to say he's saying right. I don't know about you, but I need God to continuously write upon the table of my heart his word. And, and, and church, I, I feel in my spirit that we are just not knowledgeable of what the Bible says. We're so knowledgeable or what is written on other papers, documentations and rules and regulations and guidelines that we have within our church. And I, I totally get it. We have uh, bylaws, we have set um, organizational things that have always been implemented within our churches. Mind you, those things should never, and I've said this before in these series of sermons, they should never triumph the word of God, what he wrote, what he is writing. It should never triumph. I know we have, this is what the rule says, this is what the book says, and I understand all of that, but have you at least considered the word of God? Have you considered what he wrote, what Jesus wrote through all of these penmen that are in the Bible? Have you, have the leaders, have the pastors, have you considered what the Bible says about the situation? Have you considered uh, uh, executive boards and deacons? Have you considered what the Bible says about it? Congregation, have you considered what the Lord has written about the situation? We're so quick um, to run to every documentation but the word of God. And that's a scary, scary, scary um, thing because what happens is we we step out of the will of God we we shun people we punish people we x them out when when the Bible doesn't even say anything about that this is all man-made documentation we have got to be leery and very um, cautious of the man-made documentations that are in our said churches because most of it is not even biblical and that's no disrespect to, to the forefathers who sat down um, 60, 70, 80 years ago and, and, and wrote um, a sense of order within the church. Church, we got to be very careful. The Bible, listen, Jesus is soon to come. And which documentation would you want God to write upon your heart? What was done 80 years ago or what was done 2000 or what was written 2000 years ago? I'm not disrespecting what, what, what was written 80 years ago, but, but that 2000 plus years ago, when he gave revelation to John and and not only John but all the penmen that that wrote from their perspective like the full gospels we know the Old Testament as well as the New Testament the Apostle Paul I, I want God to write that on my heart I want him to write it on my church I I appreciate the documentation I appreciate all that we have here on this paper but it's this Bible and he is saying this common thread. He said, listen, speak, say, write to the angel of the house, which, of course, is the pastor of Laodicea. Write to these pastors, these pastors. We have an obligation to stand behind that sacred desk and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about likes. Um, now, mind you, everything that we preach, everything we minister to, it has to be wrapped up in love. 
Oh, we shouldn't be behind that sacred desk preaching condemnation. We shouldn't be behind that sacred desk preaching our theory, our thoughts, and what we've always done here in our church. No, we ought to be preaching what the Holy Spirit has placed on our heart, inspired by God, and all of it wrapped in love because God is love. If there's ever a time where our churches need to get back to the biblical foundation of the gospel and the biblical foundation of the Bible, it's one of the greatest love stories ever told. Yes, I understand your, your spouse and you, you have a great, beautiful love story, and I'm so grateful tonight for it. But if we can all be honest tonight, the greatest love story ever told is the Bible. And we need love coming from behind our pulpit. Now, mind you, we also... We also need we need truth coming from behind our pulpit. We we don't need folk. We don't need pastors up there tiptoeing around sin and tiptoeing around what 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 we may feel in our spirit. We need the truth coming from behind our pulpits, truth and knowledge given to the people of God so that the people can now say, wow, I never knew um, you said that, God. I never saw it in that compassion. I never saw it that way. So this is why it's critical now that we're in this season, we're in this hour, as I've been doing these series of sermons. And God pressed this on my heart to share with the people of God. Go through the book of Revelation, all seven churches. Talk about the common thread, the common words, the common things that I keep repeating to them. And if I'm repeating them, if I'm repeating those things to these churches, I'm repeating them to you. So listen, he says, so right. Look at verse 15. He says, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou rent cold nor hot. He said, I wish you were not cold nor hot. In other words, we all know this church. Now, mind you, the church of Laodicea was a very prominent, rich church. The whole community was very wealthy, but they had a water issue. They had a water issue, so they had to they had to get water from the spring creek. So they had to get water far away from the city. So by the time the water got to the city, they had issues. By the time that the water came from the spring creek, by the time it got to the city, it was not really refreshing. It had a it had a lukewarm taste. So as wealthy as they was over here with all their money, with all of their prestigious, um, everything that they had. I mean, they had it going on. They lack water. And this is why Jesus is saying, listen, I know thy works as we have declared, because again, he knows everything that's happening in your church. You may not know, but God knows. And because God knows, that gives me a sense of hope that things are going to turn around in my church. He said, I would neither, uh, he said that thou art neither cold nor hot. You're not cold nor hot. Listen, you, you got to choose now which side you're going to be on. I pray uh, you got to choose. There's a decision that we all need to make. He says over there, I would thou wish cold nor hot. He says, listen what he says in verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. They were very rich, very prideful. Um, you couldn't tell them anything. Their God was their material possessions of things. Like lukewarm water has a nasty taste to it. This is what Christ is saying to the church of Laodicea. He is saying, listen, you're neither hot nor cold. And, and you're like lukewarm water that the first taste of lukewarm water immediately it has a disgusting taste because it's not satisfying it's not soul quenching to the body you spit it out and this is what Christ is saying you're neither hot nor cold you 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 have just forsaken everything that I have blessed you with yes I've blessed you with great wealth I blessed you with influence this was a very um, tradeful city so there was a lot going on in this city um, and the church was flourishing the city and the businesses were flourishing and if you were an entrepreneur in this town in this city everything was flowing I'm talking about your bank account was fat but yet your relationship with God was drying up this is 2022. We are living in, even though we're going through our financial woes, but at the same time, this country is still a blessed country. 
And if we as a church are not careful, we'll begin to look at other churches We'll begin to kind of desire riches. And yes, we do need the bills paid. We do need buildings built because maybe it's possible that our churches are outgrowing, which is a good thing. But church, be very careful and leery of allowing the material possessions to become your God. I don't believe the church of Laodicean started out wanting material possessions to be their God. I think they, like most churches, started small and the, the Lord just blessed them. And, and they just, you know, was blessed, but yet they allowed those blessings to kind of go to their heart and they became their God. And so therefore they truly, truly, truly got it all mixed up there. So he says, listen, uh, so then thou art neither lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth which means get out of my presence. I don't know about you, but if there was ever a season and a moment and a time that we, our churches, need to be in the presence of the Lord, we need to be in his presence now. I don't, I don't want God saying, I'll spew you out. I'll, I'll distance myself from you. You're, you're a nasty church. You're a dirty church. And even though everybody don't see your nastiness and your dirtiness and your taste, God says, I see your works. I see how dirty and nasty and filthy you are. You're putting on a smile and facade but behind all of that you're you're dirty you're nasty you're you're walking around selfish so sophisticated you thinking that you got it all God says you don't need me it's sad to say but we must be honest tonight that there's so many churches in this world that is just like the church of Laodicean that they have literally forsaken God for the mere fact that they don't really need him anymore now, mind you, every Sunday morning, they're going through the rituals, the routine. It would appear to those who don't have the spirit of discernment, it would appear that we had church, not knowing that God is not even in the building. But because of, again, the formalities and the form of godliness that we have created now. I hope this is helping somebody. The form of godliness that we have created now, that means that we can do everything that that church says we ought to be able to do. We know how to do our four songs. We know how to come up and do our prayer, the open uh, um, selection. We know how to do all those formalities, those things. We know how to do all of those and yet not even understanding if a person don't know. And it's sad to say that there's so many people sitting in congregations and they will get up uh, out of the pew and they would leave and say, Lord, we had church today, not even knowing that it was a form of godliness. Be very critical and careful, church. And so Jesus is saying, listen, I'm going to spew you out. Look at verse 17 here. He says, because thou sayest, because you speak it. He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He says, listen, you walking around bragging. Oh, my. Ooh. You walking around bragging over the mere fact of what you have. Don't you know that you're just one heart attack away from eternity? Don't you know you're just one car accident away from eternity? Don't you know that you're just one diagnosed from eternity? Church, all these material possessions and all this material things that God has given to us, first of all, you can't take it with you. And we ought to be humble enough and realize how far God has brought us. And I was, I was, this past Sunday morning, I was driving in and I was saying, God, I can see how all these praises can go to a Christian or go to a pastor's head. I said, but Lord, keep me humble. Um, never let me forget where I came from. Remind me, prick me, uh, uh, hit me, slap me, whatever it takes, Holy Ghost, for you to get my attention and say, hey, don't forget now. It was just a few months ago, a few years ago that you didn't have all that you have now. This is why it's important that we stay humble. And they were walking around acting like they got it together, having no need of anything. Look at look at verse 18. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eyes scale 
that thou mayest see. Now let's go back there where he says, to buy of me gold. What Christ was simply saying, that I want you to invest in me. Uh, eternal things is what Christ is saying. You, you have all these things outwardly, but what have you invested in me? What, what do you have? What treasures do you now have in heaven? You're working so hard here on earth, there's nothing wrong with it. But you're storing up all of your riches, all your gold, you're storing it up right here on earth. But what are you storing up in eternity? Which makes all the reason why we've got to be very careful and leery of the blessings of the Lord. And I know God is going to bless our church, Kingdom Life Fellowship. I know God is going to bless your church, but it's important that the leaders and even you tonight make sure that the blessings don't go truly to our head and we walk around arrogantly because we got a million dollars in the bank and we're sitting at Bojangles bragging about the million dollars that's in the bank. Oh, Lord, the God has blessed you with a new building and it's paid for. And I know we are to praise God for it and we are to tell folks about our testimony, but you got to be careful. I'm not telling you not to go out and tell folks what the Lord has done. Yes, we are to testify, but also we must convey to, and this is why it goes to the pastor. This is why John, Jesus is saying, Jesus is telling John to write to the pastor of Laodicea. Listen, tell the people, man. Because it's, it's important they don't get out here and get it twisted and walk around arrogantly. What are we storing up in eternity? And that's what he was saying about the goal here. And as he's saying there about the goal, trod in fire, that thou mayest be rich. He says, listen, if you store up your treasure in heaven, that's ultimately what you ought to be doing, working for the Lord. You shouldn't want all of your blessings right here on earth. You know how it is sometimes we do things here on earth. And sometimes, to be honest, if we can be honest tonight, we want our reward right here on earth. Christ is saying, listen, do the work that I've asked you to do. Bless somebody and don't want necessarily your reward right here on earth. Store those treasures up in heaven. He says also, and white raiment. He says that white raiment, and that white raiment, what he has simply said here, is his righteousness, which means his righteousness, not necessarily from the outside wearing uh, uh, material or wearing clothes and, and thinking that righteousness come within my clothes. You know, we got some folks in our said churches of today that, that they have to have on all these uh, uh, special kind of clothes and things of that sort and makes folk believe that they are righteous. Christ is saying, listen, you can have on the nicest of suits. You can have on the nicest of, of dress and all of that. You still be just as wicked in your heart. Righteousness comes from within. Oh, I hope I'm blessing somebody tonight. When I was not saved, I went to church. Mind you now, I had on my little suit, my little tie, my little uh, three-piece suit, and you couldn't tell me anything, but I wasn't right from the inside out. If you would have looked at me going into the church or looked at me at the store after I left the church, you would have been like, that man right there, that young man right there loves the Lord. That young man right there is right. But see, folks can fool you from the outside, but you can't fool God. God is saying righteousness, your garment on the inside, get your, get your stuff right, get your heart right on the inside. That's the problem that we have in the church, that we're wearing the garment, we're wearing this, this facade, we're putting on church and we're putting it all on the outside and people have forsaken the inside. I pray that through these series of sermons that we would say, God, I want to be righteous from the inside out. I don't want to be righteous so much on the outside. I don't want to look so holy and make people think I'm all this and that. But on the inside, I'm a Jezebel. I got that Jezebel spirit on the inside. No, God says, let's focus on the inside. Let's focus on your heart. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. So what's in me is eventually going to come out. His righteousness, which lies on the inside, eventually it's going to come out. So he is simply saying what's, what's in y'all. So let's look back again at verse 18 as he talks about that white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that thy shame and nakedness and do not appear. And he says, anoint thy eyes 
He said, anoint thy eyes. Now the church of Laodicea, they were known to have eye ornaments that would heal many people's eye problems. And Christ is saying, he's trying to tell them that, listen, let me, let me clear your eyes. Let me, let me get your eyes. Let me anoint your eyes that you may see, that you may see what is right, what is pure, who is holy, and who is righteous, which is Christ. He said, allow me to get your eyes back right. That's why we've got to get our focus back. Oh, I pray tonight this is helping somebody in their said churches that may have lost their vision. Yeah, you can see, but can you really see? I pray you get your vision back. I pray that the Holy Ghost would touch your eyes and you begin to see past the shouts you begin to see past all this facade but you begin to see the realness of man's heart and you'll go to praying more and you realize okay God we should not have allowed him or her into this position because Lord on the outside they they looked as if they were a gift to the church and now they are a headache now they are a thorn in our side lord if we would have just waited lord if we'd have just prayed lord if we'd have just discerned that spirit that he or she brought to the church you've got to be protective church of your church let me say that one more time you've got to be protective of your church of every ministry every pastor has got to be protective of every ministry and those that are in charge or those who've been um, gifted to, to be the leaders of these ministries. You've got to protect your ministry at all costs. This is why we need our vision back. This is why we need the Holy Spirit to help us be able to see the church of Laodicea. Again, many of us would have went to this church and when we would have left this church, we would have felt so like, man, they got it going on. And it looked like that on the outside, but, but, but to God, they didn't have it going on. In fact, they were drying up. You would have thought they were thriving. You would have thought things were well, but they were drying up. They were distancing themselves from God, not even knowing that, that the blessings that the Lord gave them were now hindering them. What do you do when your blessings hinder you? Because you allow those blessings to come between you and your first love. Oh, that'll preach there tonight. Your first love should be God. Our first love should be Jesus. And nothing, absolutely nothing should come between you and your first love. That's the problem that we now have in our said churches that we have allowed so many things to come between us and our first love. We need to get back to our first love and not only get back to our first love but excuse me, but we need to be on fire. You know, we need to be passionate about him. You remember when you first got saved, sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit and you were just on fire for God and, and you messed around and, and you joined this ministry. Now, mind you, I don't know if you prayed to join this ministry or you joined this ministry because you felt like you could help the children's ministry, but you had a bad attitude and you didn't have patience. There's no way you cannot have patience and, and have a, 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 you got to have a good attitude with working in the youth ministry because all kids are not like your kids. So you got to have a good attitude and you got to be patient. But mind you, you joined the ministry anyway. And then a year or two later, it wore you out and you said, I got to get up out of here. You know, you've kind of been in and out of the ministry. And the next thing you know, you, you, you've dried up in a sense because you have allowed all of this uh, disagreement that you've had with the pastor and the youth ministry, the disagreement that you had with your brother or your sister who was in charge of this ministry because you and them could not see eye to eye and, and believe it or not, you're not on fire like you was before. We got to be careful how quick we are to join ministries and how quick we are to just join things in our church. Some, some, sometimes I believe God just wants you to sit down in a season of just just coming to church and just getting that that uh the perspective and just getting anchored in him because again sometimes we join ministries when god has not even told us to join it 
We feel, you can't go by your feelings. I feel like I can. You know how it is, we signed a little piece of paper and we, we tell the pastor that we wanna join this ministry. I remember um, a couple of Sundays ago, we had one of our members and we were opening up a few ministries that where we kinda need some assistance in. And she took the paper and she, she brought the paper over to me. She said, Pastor, I'm just going, I'm gonna take the paper, but right now I just don't know because I have a lot going on in my personal life right now and, and it's kind of difficult for me to get here every Sunday. I'm always logged in and watching it on Facebook. She said, but I don't know if I can fully commit every Sunday to the ministry. And I applauded her. I said, that's what it's about. It's not so much about you. I'm allowing your feelings to mess around and get you involved in a ministry and you know you can't put 100% into it. And if you're gonna do ministry, you have to go all the way in. You can't just give um, 98% because that 2% there could literally cost a soul, somebody's life, somebody's life. Somebody needs to know that Jesus is real, that he still loves them. Somebody needs to know that, that God can do some great things in their lives. And that's why you got to be 100% all the way in if you're going to do ministry. So I applauded her and she said, I'm just going to pray about it. And I said, that's the approach. That's the way to take in joining a ministry as well as in joining a church. You ought not to just join no church just because you got a few goosebumps and the preacher preach and they sung your favorite song on a Sunday morning. You need to pray. You need to pray. Mind you, the church of Laodicean, if we would have walked in there looking at all that they had, many of us possibly would have joined that church because you know we love to be around folks that think they got it going on. We love to be around folks that has material possessions because sometimes, believe it or not, we, 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 we identify ourselves with that and that's, that's their God and not knowing that God has pulled me in. Not the true and living God, not the big G, but the little G. Let's look at here as we're getting ready to close. So Jesus is saying in verse 18, he talks about the white raiment, um, which is his righteousness. He talks about anointing thy eyes of course again the church of Laodicea at this time they they uh had had eye ointments and so they were very candy with the eye and he talks about the fire of course being tried and stirring up again eternal uh um eternal um, things investing in eternal things so look at what he says in verse 19 as many as i love i rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent as many as I love. Oh, I, I, I'm pausing again. I love to do that pause because I don't want you to overlook that verse. It's not a shouting verse, but it is a verse that in spite of their rejection toward Christ, in spite of uh, how the church of Laodicea, in spite of all that they had now accumulated and done, look at what he said. I love you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I love that because what he is saying, he says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. That's the NIV version there. Listen, I don't know about you, but sometimes I need God to whoop me. And I'm not ashamed to admit tonight as a pastor of a beautiful, beautiful church. But there are times where I know, and if, the, if it hadn't happened lately, I pray that in the coming weeks, days, months, and years, that God, if, if you sense and see that I have gotten or we have gotten, I've led your people um, astray, if it were, I've led them too far. I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed. I'm not one of those pastors that, that, that's ashamed to admit um, that I still need some work. And see, he says, I love you in spite of everything you've done, in spite of all that you have not done, all of your indifferences. I chasten, I, I whoop, I beat, I, I, I not necessarily X out, but I, I chastise those that I love. That's a great thing, church. That's a great thing. That's a loving and caring God that we have. That's a great thing. He says, listen, he says, not only that, he says, repent. That's the part that I need you to get tonight. Again, that's that common thread. That one word right there can literally change all of our churches. That one word right there, if we allow that word to be written on the table of our hearts, oh God, if we would allow that word, repent. Now, I'm not talking about you just saying it because you could sit right there in your living room and say, Lord, I repent. But I'm talking about putting some action to it. 
Because mind you now, you're going to have to go back maybe around your church folks, your, your church family and some people who've done you wrong and, and, and some things are maybe still happening, but yet you've repented and, and, and your attitude changes, your perspective changes and your, your thoughts changes. And it's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight. But, but every morning you get up, you tell yourself, I'm not going to be bitter anymore. I'm going to be better, God. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I've been walking in bitterness. And because of that, I've held this grudge in my heart and I've got an alt in my heart toward my brother. And I've been going to church faking it. I've been going to church worshiping you, God, when I know what your word declares, that if I got an alt in my heart, that I ought to go and get it right with my brother and then bring my gift back to you. But God, they did it. You know how it is sometimes. It ain't even about who did it, God says. It's about you repenting. So what? They did it to you. God says it's possible. I allowed it to happen to show you that you ain't all where you thought you were. Oh, this is good tonight. That's right. God sometimes will show you that you ain't as holy as you think you are. He'll show you that you ain't as righteous as you think you are, that you still got some work to do. God will show you that you got just a small glimpse of that Jezebel spirit resting down in your heart, that you're very prideful, you're arrogant, and you think you're all this, that, and a bag of chips. God says, I will allow these things to happen to show you that you need to repent. You're not above repentance. There's not a pastor, there's not an executive board, there's not a deacon, there's not a member tonight who is above repenting right now from the situation that could be happening in your church or, or even in the future. We're all subject to it, church. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. It's a part of the gospel. And I know you want to walk in the gospel, but see, that's the part that brings humility and nobody wants to humble themselves. Oh, we want to keep pointing fingers. It ain't about pointing fingers. It's about looking to the hills from which cometh my help and my help cometh from the Lord. And I need help right now, God. And if repentance is going to unlock that help, if repentance is going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out that blessing that I need in my life right now, then Father God, in the name of Jesus, I repent of the situation. God, I, I'm sorry for what I said, what I did, how I acted. I'm, I'm sorry, God, for how I misrepresented you. Lord, forgive me and have mercy upon me. God, put them back in my path that I may even go to them. Oh, my God, this is straight gospel now. Help me, Lord, go back to my brother. Help me go back to my sister. Help me go back to my church. Help me go back to whomever I have hurt God and ask them to forgive me. And if they don't want to forgive me, Lord, um, if they don't want to, you know, say, okay, I understand, God, I'm just going to kick the dust off my feet and keep it moving. But God, you saw my heart. You saw the intent of my heart is to get it right with my brother. I'm tired of going to church and just going through the motions with this all in my heart. That one word that is a common thread in all seven churches, repent. We don't even hear that now. Repent. Repent, he says. He says, repent. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Verse 20. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, can you hear him tonight, church? Can you hear Christ knocking on your heart or like the church of lay of the sin? Have your heart become so hardened that Christ is knocking on it, but you're so prideful. You cannot humble yourself because you're trying to save face. You got to save your little reputation. You got to save your name in your church, in your community. You got to save your name. I ain't repentant. I didn't do anything wrong. That's what you believe. That's what you're thinking. But you, I wonder, have you ever asked God, God, did I do that? Did I do that wrong, God? God, did I say it wrong? Sometimes it's not what you say. It's how you say it. It's how you say it. And God says, I see. Oh, I saw how you said it. So church, he's standing at the door tonight. He's standing at the door of all of our hearts tonight, knocking. He says knocking. So he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my, my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup, dine with him and he with me. Don't you know? 
that Christ is longing to come and sit and dwell and rest in our hearts. And if you rest in my heart, he's going to rest in my church. Oh, he wants to dine with us, church. He wants to sit in our churches. He wants to have free range in our churches. Mind you, remember now the mirror. He wants to be able to look at our churches and see himself. He want to see a reflection of himself. He wants to come in, but will we let him in? Will we allow Christ to come in our said churches and have free range? Yes, right. Free range to do whatever he chooses to do. Pastors, will you allow Christ to come in your church, in your pulpit? Not necessarily your church. I'm sorry, but his church. It should be his church. It literally should be his church, the building that he's put you in, along with the people that he has told you to leave. Will you allow Christ to come? Congregation, do you want him or who would you want? Do you want Christ to come and dwell in the midst of the congregation? Musicians, would you write? Would you like Christ to come and be the thread of all your songs? Be the reason why you sing? He's knocking tonight, church, in all of our hearts. And I pray that these series of sermons, I love my church. And if you love your church, you will open up that door. Oh, if you love your church, you will open up that door. Not only will you open up that door, but you will share these series of sermons. You will share tonight's message. You would, you would talk to somebody in your church and possibly say, hey, listen, I've been watching Kingdom Life Fellowship. Pastor Henry been talking for the last seven weeks about I love my church. And he broke it down as the Holy Ghost was giving it to him, the last, uh, those seven churches in the book of Revelation. And hey, listen, we know our church got some issues. Lord knows we know our church got some issues. But, but there was a common thread that he said in there. And that common thread was, God says, I know your works and I'm asking you to repent. And it got hold of me on that last night. That last night, I felt the tugging. I felt the knock of the Lord on my heart. And for so long, I've been so bitter toward my church. I've been so bitter toward the people. And this could be for anybody. It could be toward the pastor. It could be toward the leaders, um, it could be toward a congregation. Hey, whomever's watching this tonight, this, this message is just not uh, um, for the members, it's for pastors, it's for all of us tonight, self-included. That word repent, it hit different tonight. It hit me different tonight. As we come to the closure soon to be of 2022, God, I'm tired of just going through the motions in my church. I love my church, but Lord, my church got some work. We're just like the church of Laodicea. We have literally lost our way and we are no longer hot, no cold. We're lukewarm. We're lukewarm. We are a lukewarm church. Now, we we want people to think that we are on fire. We want people to believe that we that we are on fire and that we got it together. But God, in reality, I I see with the magnifying glass, I see that we are just a lukewarm church going through the motions. No wonder, God, we've not seen healing. No wonder we've not seen signs and miracles. No wonder, God, we've not seen nobody come to Christ. No wonder we've not seen our youth ministry grow. No wonder, God, we've not seen the ministry grow and be what the Bible says it should be doing, producing fruit. It should be producing. It should be growing. No wonder, God, we've not seen it because we're just a lukewarm church. And so, God, tonight I pray that, Lord, as we, as, as we hear your knock and hear your voice, that we would open our hearts. I pray my pastor would open his heart. I pray that the leaders of our church would open up their hearts and they would humble themselves. And first of all, God, they would repent. And they would get it right with each other and get it right with those that they have wronged. And they will humbly submit themselves unto you, Jesus, and ask you to ask or ask you to have your way and to do what you want them to do. Oh, that's, that's, that's good stuff right there, church. And I'm just being real tonight as we close out these series of sermons. And I pray again that they have truly blessed you in a way that you'll begin to see that. So as we close out, I pray that you would open up your mind, open up your heart for what God has to say in this hour, in this season amongst our churches. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We love you. And Jesus, we pray at the church of Laodicea, they too, like all of us, are so sometimes caught up, God, in material possessions of your blessings. I pray we not allow the blessings to become hindrance, O oh God, that we would keep our eyes fixed upon you. And that, God, every time you knock, God, we would open up to you. So, Father, have your way in all the churches that are here tonight. Bless every pastor that's watching. Bless every pastor that's in this community. God, I pray you would speak to your heart. 
pierce their hearts, O God, that they will begin to preach and teach the truth. I pray for the congregation, O God, that they too, God, would repent and that we would all cry out to you, God, and ask you to come and dwell and sit with us in our said churches. We love you and we praise you. We give you glory and honor for it all in Jesus' name. And all of God's people tonight say amen. God bless each and every one of you. And remember, I love my church. God bless you.